Mamate makeke mukwane. Where do I even begin? Coffee. Let's start with the coffee. This is Procure Accounting Services. My name is Jacques Talliard, and let's discuss this thing with, uh, yeah. Okay, so I've got some coffee. One thing I love about our country, beautiful South Africa, is the fact that we are always able to have fun on social media with our mistakes. Why is it a school? Right here. One of those mistakes is something that most of the country is aware of by now, and that is Mamati Makeke Mokwane, who is the chief of digital and information technology at SARS. We are also aware of her mistake, I mean, um, interview on Morning Live, as well as her mistake, I mean, um, appearance in front of the Nugent Committee. Now, Social media has been nothing short of savage. It's funny, really funny. But if you're not aware of what's happened and you're not aware of what's going on, you've been hiding under a rock. So what happened? Mamati Makeke Mokowane went on to Morning Live and destroyed in any bit of hope that we had initially for what's happening at SARS and for SARS going forward. Also, she then proceeded a day or so later to appear in front of the Nugent Committee, which I'll explain in a bit, and she was just completely arrogant and rude. So social media responded very savagely. And there were a couple of those tweets that hit my, my funny bone and I quite enjoyed them. But I'm not going to play that video year. I'm not going to well, play those videos here and I'm not going to show those tweets. You're welcome to take a look at them. A quick Google search. If you will, I would rather discuss some of the core problems that arose that came to light out of this inquiry and well one of the things is her interview. So some background. Now you can do a quick Google search, you will find a ton of information on this and this is a story that's still developing. But Cyril, President Cyril Ramaphosa appointed retired Judge Robert Nugent to do an investigation as to or an inquiry as to what is happening at SARS. So Nugent and, his, and some other folks are conducting a review into the tax administration and governance at SARS. The reason for this is it's been known since Nene beat Pravin Gordon in musical chairs for the position as finance minister back in the day when Jacob Zuma was still president. And all of that happened. So this committee headed by Judge Robert Nugent is known as the Nugent Inquiry. Now Andre Rabi, who is an executive for IT strategy and architecture with SARS testified at the Nugent inquiry. And he mentioned that the e-filing system, for example, or case in point, that the e-filing system is currently only functioning at between 20 and 25% of its capacity. Now, as a tax practitioner, I have noticed this. I'm going to quote from Andre Skierpers, who used to be, who is a former SARS executive. He said, I'm going to talk as a taxpayer. My tax return this year took two months to go through the process before it would take two days. My tax case is a simple one. I'm a salaried employee and I have a retirement annuity. I do not have a complex tax affair. Close quote. Now that's the current state of the e-filing process. Now, Amate says this. I'll put it up here probably. Your 
the, the, your executive for IT strategy is saying that that particular system, the e-filing system, is not at optimal functionality. He says it's functioning at 20 percent. So the question I guess I'm putting to you more pointedly is this, is e-filing on the verge of collapse or not? Definitely not. Let me explain. Um, currently, e-filing and the e forms are, are using Adobe, okay? Now, Adobe is getting out of support in 2020. Okay, let me quickly interrupt her there. What is this Adobe thing she's talking about? Now, SARS's forms work on Adobe Flash. Now, Adobe Flash is an NP API plugin that's already been discontinued support or who's which what's the, I'm not sure what's the correct term, but the support by the browsers for NP API plugins, third party plugins such as Adobe Flash has been discontinued a number of years ago. So that is not new information and that's not a new problem. Now, usually it would mean we have to go back to at least Internet Explorer 10 in order to get a good quality tax return sorted. One of the things that we do quite often is using an updated browser, using Microsoft Silverlight on Edge or Chrome or Firefox. But I find that for e-filing, I have to use Internet Explorer 10 because that's the only browser that still supports it. Now, Adobe says that they are going to stop support for this flash coding from their side in 2020. So that is the Adobe that she's talking about, this flash format that manages or in which language all of the online forms on e-filing is written. That is the Adobe that she's talking about. We are trying to move all our, what, what you'd see on your paper forms. We want to put it on a digital platform Okay, so this digital platform, this is the modernization that was started to have been implemented under, uh, what's his name? Um, Skippers. No, I'll mention his name later, Barry Hall. Barry Hall. Now, this was implemented previously. And the problem now is just not every single method of return or filing has been transferred from a paper file to this digital platform, there are still a few items, but the majority of the tax filing happens on this platform, this digital platform, either through e-filing or through an online process or, or software known as EasyFile. Most of this has already been done, but not everything. And I think she's currently referring to the entire process that has taken about 15 years where e-filing has come into play and all of that has gone on from transferring from the paper file to an electronic file. Let's continue, so. And using HTML5 as an example. Okay, she mentions HTML5. That is a very good and viable substitute for Adobe Flash, but that's already been in the process of discussion and according to me was part of a plan that I'll mention later about going forward and how to restructure and how to continue with this modernization. So nothing is going to go down except the fact that, of course, as a taxpayer, when you want to use our systems, you see a warning. Okay, this warning is, well, she mentions that this warning is likely going to scare taxpayers. Yes, because you don't want to, this is your personal details, your tax details that you are presenting to SARS, and you don't want all kinds of strange warnings. So this warning could be one of two. Firstly, it could be from Adobe to say that the Flash player is no longer being supported by Adobe. Or what's happened in the past is that quite often when you open up a Flash, the browser would give you a warning to say that this Flash is no longer supported by Firefox, by Puffin browser, by Chrome, or whatever the case may be. But if you use Internet Explorer, 10 or Internet Explorer 10, you might, well, you likely won't see that warning. 
So this is likely the warning that she's talking about. And I feel that this warning, totally irrelevant to the situation at hand. That says, are you sure? And, and that scares uh, taxpayers. And I want to say here and now that we are quite confident that uh, if I leak is reliable, we are going to change from Adobe uh, to HTML5 and it shall be business and usual, as usual, but, and we are also going to enhance it to make it user friendly. Okay, she carries on to explain a bit more about e filing and the plans that she currently has, which is not part of the question that she had. The question was how, what, at what stage is e filing functioning? At what level is it functioning? She doesn't confirm. She only confirms that there's a 99.6% uptime. Now, this uptime, I'm thankful for that because that allows me as a tax practitioner to do my job. However, that uptime doesn't make mean that the background processes are non-functional. It literally means that I can log into e-filing and I can submit my tax return. It does not mean that in the past, an ITA 34, when you submit your income tax return, the very next thing that happens is an ITA 34 or a notification of an assessment or notification of a uh, verification or an audit. Now, these would often come through literally by the time that you have fi finished clicking the block that says your return has been, has been successfully filed. By the time you click on that OK button that's on that window, the return another window would pop up and say that an ITA 34 has been um, has been uh, prepared and sent. Would you like to view this? Now the ITA 34 is the actual tax assessment. Usually that would be so quick. Now currently I find myself in a situation where an ITA 34 can be anything from one minute to a couple of hours. And that is what the problem is. And that's the functioning that they're talking about. Bear in mind that income tax is only one aspect of, file, of, of taxes that are filed. There's monthly VAT, there's bi-monthly VAT, there is semi-annual provisional tax returns, there's semi-annual EMP 501 returns, there's PAYE returns on a monthly basis. So there's very frequent tax returns that have to be filed on this system. And a lot of that fails because, or doesn't fail, is delayed because of this. Then, Andres Kieper that I mentioned earlier is a former SARS executive for modernization and he testified that he left SARS in 2016 after Moyani was appointed. Now, before he left, he provided what he called a forecast of capital expenditures for the years ending March 2019. Now, that's a couple of months from now. In those forecasts, there would have been well, there would have been an amount of about 20, 250 million rand spent on a on a yearly basis. Sorry about that. Just to maintain and upgrade the current hardware systems, and that is a problem we had. The forecast for capital expenditure. That is the issue. Now, Makeka Mukwane and Rabi pointed out well the issue that they pointed out was brought about when Tomoyani took over as SARS commissioner. Now Tomoyani seized this developmental program, this plan that was already being implemented and he just stopped it and he paid 200 million rand to a company called Gartner who is a consultancy, an IT consultancy company. Now Gartner alongside with Bain & Co um, was supposed to do a review of the IT landscape and, and systems landscape and from there on provide a recommendation for a renewal of the systems to future proof it kind of thing. Now, he paid 200 million rand for that and it was later found by the Nugent Commission that firstly, this review was unnecessary. The tender was also obtained irregularly. Now, do you know who else obtained irregular tenders? The Guptas. 
I'm just going to leave that there. So listen to this. When asked, what is your assessment of the state of the IT? Listen to this. Let me just get that. Mm, but, so but, but talking when, about when, the when, IT restructuring. Ma'am, can you give me protection from yourself? Forget about that. <laughs> but we're talking IT restructuring. Yes, ma'am. All right. Uh, let me just ask you a final question. Then. A final question is, what is your assessment right now as you and I are speaking about the state of SARS's IT infrastructure? Okay. Um, the SARS IT infrastructure has aged. Most of it is uh, about to be end of life and out of support. Let's just leave it there. Most of the IT infrastructure has aged, is at the end of life and out of support. Why is this an issue? Why is that a problem? From an accounting point of view, when you buy an asset, you expect to use it for a certain number of years and at the end of its useful life, you have depreciated it through wear and tear and it's written off or you sell it or you replace it. But the, mat the fact of the matter is that after a set number of years, from an accounting point of view, the principle is that you cannot rely on those assets anymore. Now, the IT infrastructure that she refers to here is the computer systems, the hardware, the mainframes, the networks, all of those aspects. That's at the end of life and out of support. IBM, for example, has already indicated to SARS that the hardware that SARSs use at their mainframe computers and systems are no longer being supported by IBM itself. That's what she means with out of support. This means, unfortunately, that in order for SARS to be able to maintain just basic functionality of these systems, they need to find third party ex experts and either outsource or insource those third party experts to maintain the hardware and the software. Now, the useful life can be extended through maintenance. If you don't maintain it, it's written off and you can throw it away. If you maintain it, you can get a couple of more years out of it, but that's the principle. That maintenance has not been done. Now, the useful life, SARS allows for tax practitioners or, or general companies and individuals um, a wear and tear allowance of between five and three years for IT hardware and about one year for software. Now, that's a wear and tear allowance. That means literally they expect IT hardware to have a useful life of about between three and five years, depending on the components. Because of that, even SARS is of the opinion that a computer is only worth anything for three years. Thereafter, it's worthless. That's the end of life that she refers to. The reason for that is that with the rate at which technology is manufactured and developed and improved, a change in something now could mean it becomes unreliable after a couple of years. And so companies have to continually upgrade their IT infrastructure and that is not what has happened here. Now, um, Barry Hoare, I mentioned him before. Now, he says skilled and experienced people who were pushed out of SARS previously should be brought back in so they can fix the situation. Now, I support this motion simply because there is a problem and the people that were there, that were working on them, they have the knowledge of what would be required to fix the problem. But who is this Barry Hoare? Now, Barry Hoare, let me just get his official title. According to Andre Rabi, he was the mastermind or he masterminded the IT system at SARS as we currently know it. He was, he was the chief operating officer, essentially. He was Mamate Makeke Mokwane's predecessor. So 
he is the person that resigned and then they appointed her now on on paper this woman has a number of IT related diplomas she even holds a masters of business administration from my own alma mater so one would think that she would be a competent albeit somewhat inexperienced but a fully knowledgeable candidate for this position and with a bit of guidance she should be able to do her work properly from this interview and from her appearance in, before judge nugent her arrogance and blatant disrespect for taking or for being responsible and reporting on her function in SARS and uh, as a service for the taxpayers casts in my mind severe doubt on her integrity and as a result on her competence now that certificate that you see right there is a certificate that explains integrity and the value integrity has for me and that's why i put it up in my office on my bookshelf because integrity is that important the thing for me and her entire approach and her entire demeanor to me indicates she is not interested in maintaining any form of responsibility and as a result to me that lacks integrity so in october on 21 october 2018 she said this in a press release i quote my conduct posture and demeanor may have given an impression of arrogance nonchalance and unprofessionalism and brought my competence and expertise into question this is unfortunate and regrettable and for this i take full responsibility I apologize to everyone who was disappointed or offended. That's me. I was disappointed and offended and I reject that apology. Here's why. Firstly, she earns more money in one single month than most of the people that she that reported to her would earn in a year. And then she proceeds to fire 200 senior managers. It appears to me that she doesn't understand IT. She doesn't she has a basic idea of some of the aspects of some of the terms, but she doesn't understand the concepts. At least she can't communicate what she understands if she does. Um, one would expect her to be knowledgeable about common problems and common and creative solutions to those problems, but it appears she doesn't. And she was unprepared for a nationally broadcasted interview. She was rude and she avoided questions she refused to answer some questions and not just once she did that twice within a very short period of time so should we as a taxpaying public be offended and upset absolutely SARS used to be one of the best revenue services in the world now not so much unfortunately this has come to light with as a result of the failing systems that we've identified as tax practitioners as well as this type of conduct by this individual as well as tomoyane um should we be scared no i don't necessarily think we should be scared she and Moyane, in my opinion, are just bad apples. They're not spoiling the entire bunch. There's still a lot of harvest of apples in the harvest. There's still a lot of people in SOS doing what they're doing and trying their utmost best. This kind of person just doesn't care. They only care about themselves and they are in the minority. Should we boycott paying our taxes? As much as I actually want to say yes, because we've got every reason to as a result of this, the answer to that is no. We should not boycott paying our taxes. I'm a firm believer in paying SARS what they do, because the taxes that you pay them are, in the most cases, being utilized for good. But, and I reiterate this, pay SARS what they do, but 
don't pay them a cent more than what they're due and because of that we shouldn't work out our taxes but we shouldn't willingly just throw money at sales as if we're at some kind of a bar so this is Pratier Accounting Services my name is Jacques Talliard and on this controversial topic sorry I bothered you thank you very much for taking the time for watching this video I really appreciate that and have a great day further